Good morning and welcome to the second session of our final day of Shift in 2020. After an interesting presentation by Mr. Barroso on transdisciplinary innovation, a path to sustainable development, we are now excited to give the floor and welcome Mrs. Heather Pace Clark as she will deliver a presentation on using sustainability to innovate and create new opportunities. If during this presentation you have prying questions or remarks you would like to give, we ask you to use the question function within the GoToWebinar dashboard. This seeing all attendees are muted for this session. We will make sure your questions reach Mrs. Pace Clark. But before we hand it over, we would like to talk to you about her expertise and background. She's the co-founder of Chalitics, an ETH Zurich spin-off that works with energy companies to accelerate the energy transition. She has extensive experience in sustainability and innovation, having worked at the United Nations, World Economic Forum, GE Power and France Telecom. She has a bachelor from Smith College, a master from Harvard and an MBA from LSE, HEC Paris and NYU. Now that you have a bit more background on today's guest speaker, it's time to find out how companies can leverage sustainability to innovate and better meet customer needs. Please take it away, Mrs. Pace Clark. Hi, so I hope that was an inspirational video for you to kick off the session. So my company, Gelitics, which I'll talk about in more detail later, is actually using uh, satellite data to help to accelerate the energy transition, which is a really exciting adventure to be part of. But first, I thought I would tell you a little bit about uh, how I ended up as the co-founder of a startup without any experience in data science. And I guess to kick it off, I wanted to know a little bit more about the audience with a poll. So how many of you are currently on the job search? I think there's going to be a poll that will appear. And then the second question was, what kind of job are you looking for? Are you interested maybe in starting your own company? Would you rather join another company, work for someone else, just to get a feel for where you are? So maybe if we could quickly look at the results when we're done with that. Can we see some results? If there are any out there yet? So 50% are looking for a job. Okay, lucky you. And 50% are, so that's nice and even. And what about the kinds of jobs you're looking for? Let's see. 50% uh, want to start your own company. Okay, great. 
and 10% family and 20% a big company. Okay, that's interesting insight to have. So I can tell you a little bit my journey and how I ended up working for a big company and then a smaller company. But let me make sure you can see me here. I think the slides are gonna appear in a second. Great, so uh, I'm just gonna make sure I can transition here. What I think is maybe fun to say is that I actually come from a hotel family. So my dad uh, studied at the hotel school in Lausanne and his first job was working, um, I think at the Beau Rivage Palace in Lausanne and then working with Hilton Corporation and ultimately having his own hotel. So my first job was actually working in the family hotel, making salad and bread in the restaurant. So I have a lot of respect for people in the hospitality industry. I know it's not an easy job and it takes lots of patience and time. I also want to just switch the slides here. Let's just see what I need to do. Just to switch to the next slide. There we go. So here you can see the palace in Lausanne and uh, the Waldorf Astoria, where my dad was the manager when he was working for the Hilton Corporation. And then the Holiday Inn, the family hotel, where I really learned about how hard it is to be in the hospitality industry, but just how exciting it is. And I think that working in that industry gives you really good skills for life because you have to really put the customer at the heart of everything that you do and you have to innovate and be agile and flexible to succeed. So my father wanted me to join the hotel business, but I was a little bit deviant and decided that I wanted to save the world and join the UN. So in my journey, I also did this MBA, as was mentioned earlier, and one of our favorite professors was Taleb, who actually wrote this famous book called The Black Swan which is about how hard it is to really predict the future. That even if we have the best data, we can't really predict what's coming. And there are a lot of big events like COVID that are rare that we are really not prepared to deal with. So my experience has been that sustainability can really help us to address these crises and to create new opportunities. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. So, I guess you've been talking a lot about sustainability and what it is, about the sustainable development goals, and there's a lot of focus, particularly today, on the climate crisis and on environment. I wanted to just sort of make the case for the importance of putting the human at the center of all these activities and really thinking about the social and the economic drivers that are key to really implementing an effective sustainability strategy. So one of my favorite thinkers in this area actually came up with a term called triple bottom line, which is really about looking at the social, economic, and environmental aspects of sustainability all together. And that by looking at these, you can actually create new opportunities and better meet your customer needs. And that's kind of where I've tried to focus my career and where I think you can have a lot of fun along the way. So I wanted to save the world. I wanted to become a diplomat. So I started out at the UN in a lot of big meetings. It was a great opportunity. This is a picture of the Palais de Nations in Geneva, not so far away from Grand Montana. And I sat in a lot of really exciting meetings, but they were pretty boring. There were a lot of reports written that never actually got used. So I got a little bit frustrated. So then I decided to transition to the World Economic Forum because I wanted to actually work more with businesses. And uh, it was really exciting because I was able to still work with the UN and build partnerships between the private sector and the UN. And I think that's a key point when it comes to sustainability today and innovation. It's really all about partnership and bringing different sectors to work together because sustainability is really driven by regulation and what the government requires and then bringing uh, civil society and business along. So when I was at the WEF and we first started talking a lot about sustainability, it was really a lot about philanthropy. So it was a lot about charity. So it's really been important over the last few years to transition from what was just charity and philanthropy and doing good to really what is about uh, creating a shared value and actually thinking about integrating sustainability into your business activities to really make it effective. So Bill Gates is a really interesting example of that with his foundation, which did fantastic work uh, particularly in the health field. We've all heard recently about his work with vaccines, and now he's actually investing in energy companies to make those investments even more sustainable so they can last over the long term. So after some time at the WEF, I thought it's a lot of fun to go to these big meetings and meet some cool people. I got to ride in a car with Bono. That was very exciting. I got to give a Coke to Bill Gates and do some really important advocacy work and build partnerships. But I really wanted to get my hands dirty and move into the business sector 
and really make sustainability happen more directly. So then I transitioned to um, the private sector. But I think what is interesting to mention is that I sort of experienced one of the first crises and another aspect of sustainability that's important that maybe doesn't get talked about very much. It's a lot about ethics and it's about the responsible behavior of, of business executives and, and employees to do things like fight corruption, particularly in emerging markets where it can be a big problem. So when I was actually working at the WEF, um, we had a major crisis. Uh, Enron uh, was accused of some fraud, and they were actually chairing the World Economic Forum the annual meeting one of the years that I was there. And it was just a reminder of really the importance of ethics. And when you're dealing with sustainability and making sure that there's, a, there's an ethical aspect to it, but also when it comes to these crises, how do you actually, how do you actually reinvent yourself and, and uh, manage along your career journey? So this was a big turning point, this along with the dot-com bust, where we all saw the stock market lose a lot of value and we had to really rethink how we create value for ourselves and for our clients. So one of the great thinkers around this again, um, uh, Mr. Elkington is shown here. He's the one who came up with the triple bottom line um, idea. And I first started working with him while I was at the WEF. And he's a great guy to follow if you want to stay on top of sustainability trends. This is from one of his latest presentations at the B Corps. The B Corps is a really interesting organization for you to know about. They have an office in Geneva and they basically certify businesses globally for certain sustainability standards. So these are a group of businesses that really put sustainability at the heart of everything that they do. There are a lot of them that are actually in the hospitality industry. So it might be interesting for you to look at them and see what they're doing all kinds of exciting things to come up with more eco-friendly uh, business models and more uh, customer-friendly business models. So he was presenting to all of the B Corp businesses and he talked about really the COVID crisis and where we are right now. And really what it's about is looking at how you can deal with all of this uncertainty and also a lot of the social resistance and the political issues that we have to deal with right now. So obviously it's a very difficult dip that we're going through now, but a lot of innovation can come out of that. So it's really about thinking about what are the new opportunities that you can already engage in, particularly if you want to start your own business or even as part of a bigger business. What are the kinds of activities and the new opportunities that we might be able to create out of this dip to better meet customer needs? So, this is kind of a fun drawing of how you might visualize what all of this uncertainty means. So clearly it means that we have to really rethink capitalism and how it's working, but we also need to have sort of a, a tech mindset and sort of bring the startup methodology to a lot of different things that we do. And that just means trying new business models, testing new ideas, seeing how they work, leveraging things like artificial intelligence and other kinds of big data to really better understand trends, and so I think uh, this is sort of an interesting visualization of how we can both address the sustainable development goals, but also create new growth and new business opportunities with business models um, that are really, really changing and new and new ideas that I think all of you could develop uh, in the hospitality industry if that's where you choose to stay. So back to my journey into the private sector, I actually joined France Telecom and that was exciting. I was managing their sustainability activities. And of course, recycling mobile phones was really important and looking at reducing carbon, that was really important. But I think what was even more valuable was the stakeholder engagement that we did to really understand what were the needs of our clients and how we could better meet them. So we did a whole series of interviews with clients and also with uh, NGOs, with political leaders, with the media to understand what do they really need. And we identified a whole new range of opportunities and also risks that we have to manage better. So for example, when we talked to clients in emerging markets in Africa, they didn't have any banking source and they also needed health services. And we were able to use our mobile service uh, activities to deliver the mobile phone banking, which was a great project, and to do that before people in Europe were using mobile phone banking. So we were able to bring together a coalition of governments, people working in R&D in the company, and also uh, small uh, micro enterprises to actually deliver um, a mobile phone banking platform, which created a lot of new opportunities for entrepreneurs. Uh, and it was a really exciting thing to be part of. Another big thing that we had to do there was, for example, work on privacy standards and work on human rights issues, because that was actually a big concern for our clients 
to feel that we were using their data in a responsible way and that we were also giving them giving them a way to manage their own data and privacy. So those were not really environmental aspects, but they were key social, uh, I would say socially driven activities that were able to generate a lot of revenue for the company while also allowing us to really uh, be more be more sustainable. Then there was another crash. So actually, I went to Harvard and I did my, my master's. And um, it was interesting because I had a contract and the job got canceled because there was such a, a crisis in the economy at the time. So uh, it was interesting to think, OK, how do I reinvent myself? I have years of sustainability experience, but I couldn't get a job in sustainability because most of the jobs disappeared because they weren't considered part of the core business. So I had to really rethink what I was going to do. So the only job that I could get at that time uh, where I was living was actually a job in marketing and public relations. And this is something I would have never considered before, but I ended up really enjoying it. So I worked with a very large solar company. And this was another case where we saw sustainability was a way to differentiate. So you can see this solar module here. So if you look at a solar module, they all look the same. So it's a little bit hard to differentiate. So what we were able to do was to look at what was unique about our solution, which was that it was much more uh, green, if you want to call it that, than the other products provided by our competitors. They were using coal-fired power plants to produce these modules, and we were using hydropower. So the carbon footprint of our solution was actually much lighter. So we were able to really do some interesting marketing around this um, and to increase our sales, and then also to do some things around European production or US production to then get a premium for our product. But we were able to do the production in Europe and in the US and really secure more jobs in those markets, which was a great thing to be part of. And it was an interesting way, again, to use sustainability to really uh, drive, drive growth. And an interesting example of how you can pivot, how you have to pivot sometimes to uh, find a job and to expand your skill set and find something uh, new that you maybe didn't expect, which was the case for me in that situation. Then if we continue to the next slide. Seems to be slow. Oh, OK, so then I thought I want to go to an even bigger company. You know, there's some brand names you really want to work for. I don't know what they are in the hotel business. Maybe you want to work for the Four Seasons. Uh, in energy, GE was sort of the gold standard. So everyone wanted to work there because they had the biggest portfolio of products when it came to energy. They were doing everything. And one of their really interesting campaigns was called Eco Imagination. And it's a great example of how to use sustainability uh, as part of your strategy, but also as part of your brand and marketing activities. They invested a lot of money in R&D to develop new products to better meet customer needs trying to, to transition from uh, coal-fired power plants uh, and nuclear to other kinds of technology, including software. So it was a really exciting company to be part of. And this eco-imagination uh, campaign was very interesting. And it was a full program that went on for several years. There are a lot of case studies available about it. So I would encourage you to read those and learn a little bit about uh, how you can really integrate sustainability into your strategy and into your marketing activities. And then uh, what was kind of interesting was that we had to transition in the company to really become more digital. And this is something that's going on everywhere. I'm sure you're all aware of it with the fourth industrial revolution, industrial revolution. We have to really think about how to leverage data and how to make things more automated and really uh, be more efficient and optimize our activities. So GE wanted to do the same thing. And it also was a lot about innovation. So in order to continually innovate, we introduced a program to actually bring Silicon Valley methodology called FastWorks, um, basically based on uh, something that a writer called Eric Ries developed to figure out how to pivot and change and innovate in the company more quickly and come up with new products. And this is also, again, about putting the customer at the heart of everything that we did, constantly trying to come up with um, minimal viable product. If we saw that there was a need, we would develop a, a, a small prototype, test that with a client, see if it would add value. One of the biggest examples was something called a digital twin. So I could take a, a gas turbine and I could make a digital model of that 
and I can monitor the activity of that gas turbine and figure out when it needs to be repaired and do a lot of things to optimize the performance of the fleet using the power of big data. So it was an exciting thing to be part of to make sure that we could really innovate at the pace that we needed to and to try and roll this out into the company. It was a, it was a great experience. But I have to say, not to spoil the, uh, the story, actually the company went through a lot, a lot of problems after this. And there were many challenges in the market because we really didn't see the shift to renewable energy coming as early as we needed to. And this was largely due to really not having the best data on the market, but also really not having the best data from our customers about what they cared about and where they were going. So even though we had a great sustainability strategy, we had this great innovation approach internally, we still were not really on top of what our customer needs were. And so I think that that's an important lesson is that even if you have all of these great programs internally and sustainability is a key driver of the organization, if you don't listen to your clients and really have the right data, then a lot of things can go wrong. So here's a quote talking about how fast works, this kind of um, startup approach didn't really, didn't really deliver what everyone expected. And the company went through a lot of challenges. So after that situation with GE working for a big company, I really rethought and said, okay, if I want to make a difference, if I really want to create a sustainable business, I probably need to create my own business. So I pivoted again, and this is after my MBA. I uh, focused on entrepreneurship, and I just started learning as much as I could about entrepreneurship and startups. So I went to a lot of these networking events that happen a lot in Zurich and in Lausanne. So you can actually do them virtually from the comfort of your own home. You can meet a lot of really great thinkers who have their ideas about starting a business and you can actually work with them. So I went to something called uh, speed dating and I met my co-founders. This is an example of one that took place uh, this week. So I encourage you to look at those opportunities if you want to start your own business and see who's out there and really learn from them. So I did a lot of listening, talking to other co-founders, thinking about what are my skills, what can I really do to add value, building on my, my uh, energy experience. And it was a great chance to learn. Uh, and so I really uh, would encourage you to look at those opportunities. And that's where I started working with a lot of ETH organizations, including the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Lab, where our company currently sits. So it's a really inspiring place to be because there are a lot of people that are building their own companies, so you can learn a lot from them in the process. And more and more, sustainability is at the core of what these startups are doing. So there are also very specific programs where you can really look at sustainability and how to integrate that into your business model. So what do we do? The, the story is kind of getting back to where we started. So Jolitics is an ETH spinoff. And really what we do is we take all of this great data that you saw in the beginning from the satellite imagery and we make it easier to plan new infrastructure. So what you see here in the background is SBB, one of our clients. They have a lot of lines that they have to repair. So that can include building new lines, repairing old lines, building new railway. So we can basically automate this process and make it much more digitized. So we take the data and we combine it with 2D and 3D visuals and give them the tools that they need to better communicate. And this is really critical now as they try and better serve the needs of their clients from their desks. So instead of going out into the field as much as they used to in the past, they actually have to do a lot of this sitting behind their desk somewhere. So we're helping many clients to automate this planning and then our ultimate goal really is to contribute to the uh, energy transition and become the software standard for planning of this kind of infrastructure. So I'll just touch briefly on what the planning problem is. I think this is a problem in most industries. I think in hospitality, Airbnb and Kayak, many other players have really helped to digitize the industry, but in many other industries, they're much more behind the curve because they haven't had to change and adapt so quickly. So most of the projects that we deal with are actually over budget and there's millions of euros that are lost in the process and they're often very, very late. So many of the things are manual. So looking at these kinds of uh, gaps is a way that you can identify potential opportunities in any industry. There also is a lot of social resistance. So definitely there are very large environmental concerns, but there are equally a lot of social concerns. There's a lot of social resistance when it comes to where you're putting new infrastructure. 
I think it's the same thing when you're trying to decide where to put a, a new resort. There's a lot of resistance often in the communities, so you have to think about what's the most responsible way to do this, to engage all the local stakeholders so we can get approval for the project, but do it in a, in a sustainable way. So what we do is really try to help to address the concerns that landowners, that NGOs, that governments might have to make a new infrastructure to make this process easier and faster. So here's actually a demo of the software. So this is basically taking a lot of satellite imagery and generating the route for a power line in Colombia. So I realize this is a little bit uh, far away from hotels, but it's just a way to visualize how we can quickly and easily take data and cover hundreds of kilometers of rainforest in Colombia to figure out where you place a new power line in the most optimal way. So you basically figure out what data you want to measure. You can then select parameters and generate as many scenarios as you need, and then visualize the route in 2D and 3D and also in augmented reality. So it's a very interesting way to make the whole process more interactive and engaging and more accurate. And then these analytics can tell you, for example, what's the cost of the project going to be, how much CO2 is going to be consumed when doing the project, as well as giving you output that you can easily uh, share and communicate with other stakeholders. So I think the same kind of ideas, better visualization, better data management could also apply to your industries. Just to cover geospatial data, because it's usually not clear to a lot of us, usually I'd say the product is basically like Google Maps for infrastructure. So if you want to figure out how to get to Starbucks, the closest one to you, you just take your mobile phone and you type into Google Maps and it tells you exactly how to get there and how much it's going to cost you if you take an Uber. We're basically doing the same thing for the infrastructure business. So you take all kinds of layers of data. It can be social, economic, uh, environmental, all kinds of data and put it into our algorithm and basically do a lot of processing, mathematical modeling. And then from that, we're able to generate the route. So why is the time now? I guess as we all look at the future, we need to think about where are the opportunities? And there's a lot of discussion ongoing about investing in sustainable infrastructure and really thinking about how to make these projects more effective. So we think it's the right time to have a technology that's improving performance through digitization. So I think it's great for all of you as well in your own journeys to think about what are the opportunities out there given the current climate, climate? where are people investing? So I would recommend that you kind of keep abreast of current affairs and try and see where these investments are going to be made. Another one of our clients is Swiss Grid. So basically they use the tool to be more efficient and to make the whole process more transparent. So having better data management, better visualization, it can really help uh, to improve communication and, and make our customers happier, which again applies to the hospitality industry as well, I think. So to take it back to John Elkington, who I mentioned earlier, the founder of the Triple Bottom Line, he also uh, is uh, writing a lot. He has a great blog and one of his most recent books has looked at really how we need to look at the black swan as an opportunity to create green swans to create new business models and new ideas and to test them to really create a new kind of capitalism that has sustainability at the heart so i think that's an exciting challenge that all of you can take on uh, thinking about really in the hospitality industry what are the kinds of new business models that are needed how can we better meet customer needs there are a lot of great examples out there uh, bcor is one place to start but uh, I think it's an exciting time to be uh, working in that industry and seeing how you can help to drive the innovation forward. So just to get to the next slide. So I wanted to leave you with a call to action. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I work out of the ETH in Zurich. There's a great competition called Venture that's actually run by the ETH, but also by EPFL, the German government, and it's completely free. You do not need to be a student uh, at the ETH or EPFL to participate. I think most of it will be online this year, but basically it's a competition where you can develop your ideas to start a new business. So it's sort of a set of timelines that you have to follow to develop a business plan, to identify a team to work with you, and to really develop your business model 
and you get a lot of free support from the government. You get access to a lot of great free coaches who have a lot of expertise in entrepreneurship. You get a lot of free training on intellectual property, all kinds of topics that are really relevant. You also uh, get a great opportunity to meet Meet with other people if you also want to develop businesses and you can ask them to join your team if you don't have your own idea you can join another team so it's a great way to test if you like entrepreneurship you can really see if you want to start your own business if it's something you want to move forward with this is a really really great process to do that so the uh, submissions are open and it's not very complicated to do a submission it's just a short powerpoint and you can you can submit your idea and still benefit from all of the resources for several months so it's a great way to test and to challenge yourself a little bit and meet some really great people. So I encourage you all to uh, participate in that if you're interested. There's also the Impact Hub in Zurich. They're also in Geneva, I think, and Lausanne. They have a lot of great ideas linking business with sustainability. So a really popular buzzword for the moment is something called circular economy. I guess you heard about it, really looking at the life cycle of products and thinking about how to reuse everything and to re reduce waste. There are a lot of great ideas around food, for example, in this area. So they also have the Impact Hub a series of free training courses and also a accelerator where you can submit your idea and get feedback and get free coaching and join a community working on these topics. Again, it's totally free. All the events are available online. So I'd encourage you to look at those events, think about attending some and just get a feel for if you think it's the right area for you. So I wanted to end uh, with a little bit of inspiration from Conrad Hilton. So I'm sure you've all heard of the famous Hilton Corporation. Of course, now we look at Airbnb and see how they maybe have pivoted uh, faster and put Hilton and a lot of other hotel chains under pressure. But I think he had a lot of good things to say about the importance of really trying different things and that you won't always succeed and failure is okay, but it's part of the learning process. And it's certainly part of the innovation process and certainly part of the sustainability process. A lot of people working in this area, including John Elkington, were rejected many, many times before they could even get an article published on the topic because people weren't taking it seriously. So we all need to just keep trying and keep experimenting and keep innovating. And I wish you the best of luck in doing that through your job search or through the creation of your own businesses. So I think that's everything on my side for the moment. Well, thank you very well, much, Heather. Uh, that's, uh, that's great. That was uh, really interesting to to hear that, and obviously it's very interesting to, as opposed to looking to black swans, to rather look at green swans. I mean, I'll find them a bit strange to see, but it's obviously a figure of speech. But definitely uh, nice to move away from uh, looking at the opportunities only. And I mean, this is also definitely um, we've got some questions, so I'm going to start with those. But when it comes to um, a new kind of way of uh, of rethinking how we are using products with when you just said about the circular economy are we using that enough do you mean that also like as truly giving products a second life or are we really looking more into how we can better recycle certain products whether that being uh clothing electronics or, or resources for that matter yeah there are a lot of different business models so uh it's usually about thinking about how to reuse products. Products is definitely uh, one way, like things related to food waste. If you know the uh, the app, good to go. Too good to go, yes. Yeah, exactly. So for example, they have a great way to address food waste so that you can, you know, at the last minute buy all of this food at a great discount uh, and prevent a lot of food waste. So that's one example. There are things like clothing. So one of the startups that we worked with was sending a box of baby clothing uh, every few months, basically preventing a lot of waste as kids are growing quite quickly, uh, throwing away clothes. So that's another interesting model as a subscription model. There are many, many great examples. And uh, I encourage all of you, because it's probably closely linked to the food and beverage industry and hospitality, to think about uh, opportunities there. Yeah, it's actually a, a better way to see all um, surpluses of food being thrown away to still be able to give that either a good cause or to be able to resell that still if it's still in good uh, order it's obviously much better i've got a question yeah. coming in from uh, marnix for saying um how do you think capitalism is a, is a sustainable system for the future yeah i think it's a good question i mean uh, i've got this book 
Capitalism by Piketty on my bookshelf. I started reading it, but I didn't finish it. I think we need to really be more realistic about growth. So we can't probably have the same levels of growth that we've had in the past. So we need to be really more accepting of slow growth and that's the way of the future. And that should make it easier to have a more sustainable growth. So I think that's definitely part of it. And probably a little bit more government regulation is required. If we really wanna be sustainable, we're gonna to have to have a little bit more regulation probably have a price on carbon to really change behavior. So I think uh, there's definitely a role for government to potentially get more involved in several right. situations. And I, do you feel that there's not enough legislation in that sense or or that we are, because I mean, obviously we're having some companies that are very high into, I would say, governments itself. They're, they've been driving economies for a long time. We're, we're, we're obviously touching the fact that you've worked for GE Power. These electricity companies are now making the shift, uh, but obviously within their supply chain, we're having a lot of companies that are dealing with fossil fuels, that are powering these, uh, the, these centrals and everything. Are they doing enough to make the change? Uh, the bigger oil companies, uh, you know, for instance, just be a uh, bit no. devil's advocate because obviously sustainable, renewable energy is one thing, but obviously we still have a supply chain of a lot of companies that are dealing necessarily with necessarily with things that are good for the environment. What do you feel? Yeah, so definitely uh, they're not gonna change unless there's more regulatory pressure. So one of the great things about a startup is you can work with all of these clients, including oil and gas companies, and try and push them to digitize further and to build this new renewable energy infrastructure faster. So from what I've seen also with sustainability, if it wasn't mandated by the government, it was very difficult to push it forward unless the company saw a business opportunity there, which is why it's really right. important to use business skills and use a business model approach to sustainability to make it really sustainable and viable. And, and do you feel that, that people are now, uh, well, obviously they're going to have to reinvent themselves to some extent because we're probably still gonna see an economic recession happen after this pandemic, pandemic is really truly over. But do you feel that they're going to be using sustainability as a driver to to get business or do you feel that now we are starting really to see the shift within people's mindset in order to want to have sustainability as the forefront of everything that they do i think it you see consumers particularly millennials are really seeing this as a core driver for their decision making what they buy right so as the consumer uh, decides that they want more responsible goods, then that's really going to make the shift happen. So it's really about understanding your customer and understanding the shift that's going on in their mindset. So I think that's definitely key, but people will still be sensitive to price. So that's kind of uh, the reality yeah. we're going to deal with. Yeah. Now, I mean, obviously, uh, renewable energy is is one thing, uh, and, and touch on that as well with Mark, who has asked another question. Uh, would you discourage the using nuclear energy as an energy source and why yes or why not? I mean, obviously, we have difficulty getting rid of the waste, but in itself, nuclear energy is a very efficient process, obviously, to gain energy from. But obviously, we're, we're left with waste that is very difficult to, to deal with. What do you think? Yeah, well, I think going back to the data point and just how important it is to manage data. For example, in Switzerland, when they were building these nuclear power plants, they didn't actually actually calculate into the costings the cost of managing the waste, which is kind of unbelievable. But it just shows how hard it is to think about things in a sustainable way and the overall life cycle of a product. So I would say it really depends on the country. So the citizens have to decide if they are comfortable with this. And so France thinks it's fine. That's great. They have systems to manage it. Italy, Germany, they have a different opinion. So I think it's really up to the citizens in each country to decide really what's what's best for them. Yeah, or should, or should, should this be driven more by the Europe as a, as a as a factor of like as a collective? Or do you feel that this is up for the governments in their own in their own right yeah. to, to think about? I think to be realistic, it's going to be really a, on a case by case basis. So I think that every government is going to decide what's best for their for their citizens. And that's just the reality. Okay. The sustainability things that really work are local initiatives. It's local citizens expressing their mind, expressing their viewpoint. Um, and I think that there's no one fit solution for everything. Yeah. No, no definitely not. Uh, I got a, another question coming off uh, Yoka Tasma, who is saying, is the dare to venture uh, forward available to students outside of Switzerland as well? You know what? Um, I'm not sure what the requirements are. 
it was before, of course, when things were not online, you had to be a resident in Switzerland. It's worth looking at their looking at their website. It, probably if you join a team that's led by someone who is Swiss based, it, there could be the potential to join. So I would I would right. look into that. I can't give a complete answer, but it would be worth exploring. Well, that's yeah. Yoke, I would say uh, go uh, try to look it up on the web and then uh, see what the uh, actual requirements are. And uh, if if it is open to students outside of Switzerland, please pass it on. I mean, obviously, we need as much ideas as we can get to help yeah, us and the impact, save the planet. Sorry, the Impact uh, Hub is, is globally active. They're all over the world. So Impact Hub is really in almost every country. So I would look at the Impact Hub network in your area and see see where the closest one is, because it's also a good entry point to similar activities. Yeah. I mean, uh, when it comes to, to, to entrepreneurship, you said there is still a lot of opportunities now that are going to be coming in regards to sustainability for entrepreneurs. Um, do you feel that this is still in a traditional capitalist one, like there's a couple people and that are then at the peak of, of this particular job venture that they're starting up or this just job opportunity? Because Mr. Barroso, I'm trying to point back to the previous presentation that we had, he said he that it is not a singular effort anymore but it should become more a collective success he says not necessarily cap well reinventing capitalist society perhaps but he said um, it should be a collective success from a community of people and what are your thoughts and on, on this and, and potentially moving towards a, a transdisciplinary society yeah, well, I would say definitely partnership is key. If we look at hospitality, Airbnb, I mean, they're being regulated in different ways in different countries. And clearly, if they want to continue to operate, they have to work with local governments and local communities who are really not happy about the way they operate. So you definitely need to have uh, this partnership. Of course, it's transdisciplinary, absolutely. And it's about partnership and working together with different groups to really get the communities to, to buy into these new business models, which are quite scary for people. So that's why I think the social aspect is really key, because a lot of these things include, you know, bringing on new technologies that people are quite afraid of, because they're afraid they'll lose their job, they'll lose their status, and in some cases they will. So we have to think of responsible ways to help them make the transition to make these big step changes that we need to be more sustainable. Right, right. I still have a, a remark coming of uh, Ms. Favre Buhl. She's saying, we are actually at La Roche. We are also on to good to go. So if uh, uh, or people want, yeah, exactly. So we have a lot of food that is being produced and obviously not all the food necessarily gets eaten all the time. So you can indeed also buy uh, great portions of food for a really reduced price uh, within La Roche. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, yeah. So, the, the last I point that I... Have... Yeah. No, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I just would say that I'm sure that you, amongst the students, if you look at good, Too Good To Go, there are other ideas that you could have that you could pilot that would be just as interesting. So I encourage you to brainstorm together and think of some of them if you want to start your own business. There's also a lot of funding from the Swiss government available as well. Right. So for those who are local, there are really opportunities and funding specifically to sponsor sustainable enterprises. So that's the difference, oh, yeah. the government giving money for that. Yeah, no, but we were starting an innovation hub within La Roche, in which we are also uh, truly tr trying to push for this entrepreneurial mind uh, mindset to be developed even further, and that people can even leave with a potential business once they graduate with us or or they continue working. We have industry experts that are coming in to help our students to to start these processes. And um, in the end, their success is our success. So we're just trying to nurture this uh, this way, and obviously it will have to be more and more into sustainability so i was just still curious about geolytics as a, as a final point uh, obviously that started off in switzerland as a as an eth uh, spin-off as you said you showed us an example of this is focusing on colombia i think it was or or a south american country where you are showing where the power line should be put are you feeling that for geolytics this is a, a very big market to go and look into to make the right decisions when it comes to creating new energy uh, or power lines whatsoever so that they don't cut away from the forest that are also so important for the world in that sense. Are you really feeling that the BRIC countries are, are very yeah, your, no, your so main see, focus? Yeah, we see huge opportunity in, um, in South America, 
potentially also in Africa and the Middle East, where there are a billion people that don't have power. So there are a lot of people who really need energy and they want to provide it in the most responsible way. So yes, there are a lot of opportunities in, in those countries. In addition to Europe, because there's a whole transformation going on, but definitely uh, right. we're working in North and South America as well. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's great. That's great. I mean, as a final point, if people will, you've already said you're you have reinvented yourself in the time of crisis. Uh, I don't know, it was at the dot-com bubble, I think you said that you had to reinvent yourself or right thereafter. Let's let's think in a not necessarily the most positive outset, but we're going to have a lot of waves of uh, people going broke, people, uh, business going out of business. How would you feel? What is your advice to people? How can they best reinvent themselves? How would you say, take these steps as a final point to... Um, how can they reinvent themselves? How can they go ahead in order to, and afterwards come out back on top, having learned something? Yeah, I think it's good to talk to people who've done it, um, and particularly people who maybe are in your industry and hospitality who have done it. So I think uh, really networking is really, really key and getting inspired from people who've done it because you can't do it alone. That would be the number one point. You really cannot do it alone. You need partners, you need co-founders if you're starting a business. And we're really lucky here in Switzerland and also online, you can access so many things for free, attend so many conferences, really networking and learning from other people and getting a coalition behind you, maybe even a mentor uh, who can listen to you and guide you through the process. That's really critical because if you do it alone, uh, you're much less likely to be, to be effective and it just takes longer and it's less fun. So build a coalition Definitely. for yourself. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that let me uh, to just thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Heather Pace Clark. I don't know if I should say Pace Clark all the time. I don't know if that's uh, the right way to say that's it. Okay. That's great. No problem. But uh, best of luck to everybody. Have a nice weekend and uh, get out yes, there thank and you so uh, very much. find uh, we, a new We truly appreciate the time that you've put in into this presentation uh, and your wealth of knowledge. Obviously, having worked for all these different companies, put on all the different hats, and, and obviously, you've learned something in all of these experiences that you've had in the past. And now, obviously, you're using that to push Gelitics forward. So. Um, very interesting. And I would like to just uh, also end by saying to everybody, if you still have any questions or remarks that you have thought of after this presentation will be ending, that you can just get in touch with us at the Shipton uh, organization and we will get in touch with uh, Ms. Heather Clark to pass you those notes on. And I mean, dare to venture forward, please look at that as well. Mm -hmm. And I would like to let you know that we do have a keynote this afternoon starting at 2.30 p.m. Central European time from Oceanic Global and the partnership that it has with La Roche. So if you guys have not yet signed up for this particular let's do and, uh, that and we look forward to seeing you there. Once again, thank you very much, Heather, and I wish you a very pleasant continuation of your day and thank you everyone for having joined us for this presentation. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.